excise or two words that we probably won't be saying again after those comments. Um, but we will be talking about bucket team. And I guess one way to start is by uh, introducing ourselves. As Carol mentioned, my name is Jeff Egan and I work for the John Deere Industrial Equipment Company. I live down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and the job title that I have is a part support specialist, which means, or the responsibilities that go with that job title are that I go out and I visit with our John Deere industrial equipment dealers and primarily I spend my time talking with people in the parts departments, helping the parts managers manage their inventory and also market their parts. So it's, uh, there's a lot of challenges involved with the job and also gives me a chance to also spend a little bit of time working with the service departments as well and also cross over and spend a little time with the sales departments. A little bit about my background for what it's worth. I uh, was born and raised up in, oh, in, in Iowa and uh, have been down here visiting Keystone Equipment in Oklahoma and CO Lloyd in Oklahoma. About uh, three years ago, I took on this job and uh, traveled Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. And just about two months ago, my territory got shrunk down a little bit. So in the future, I'll only be calling on the state of Texas. And I'll no longer get the opportunities to come up here to find state of Oklahoma with people I blew up here at Keystone Equipment. Um, most of my background, uh, unlike maybe many of you, I've never been exposed to a lot of mechanical types of things when I was a little kid growing up. About the most mechanical thing that I did was wind my watch when I was uh, in grade school. I never took it apart put it back together. And a lot of people that uh, I find working at our John Deere dealers, for example, in the service departments, they were people, types of people who would take around their car when they were high school age. They'd rip things apart, put new engines in, take things apart, all kinds of mechanical things. I would never like that. So I, I don't have a real strong mechanical, technical type background, but still I'm able to learn an awful lot of that stuff as I keep going on day by day, spending time talking with parts people and service people at our dealerships. So it's a it's sort of a whole new area for me. Probably, maybe quite a bit different for most of you. I would guess that many of you have more of a mechanical type background, and you've had a lot more uh, experience along those lines, and you probably maybe a little more comfortable working on things that you can take apart, put back together, and find out what's wrong with them, that sort of thing. I wish I had more talents like that, but I guess it takes all different types of people to make the world go around. So we have to give and take, and then uh, draw on our strengths and try and help other people with with, uh, with uh, our weaknesses draw on their strength and helps out through the whole uh, picture of things. So anyway, I'm getting a little bit long-winded, um, so before I go too far and bore you too long, I probably should turn it over to Lou and he can tell you a little bit about who he is and a little bit about his background. His background is probably a little bit more of interest to you than mine is, so I'll let Lou take over for a while. Okay, I'm Lou Martin. I work at Keystone Equipment. We're a John Deere industrial leadership <coughs> in Sand Springs and in McAllister. Uh, <coughs> Well, my background is, uh, well, I'm born and raised in Sepulveda and uh, been in the Air Force and worked as a crew chief on C-130 after I got out of high school. And uh, before I got out of high school, I was planning on coming to Oklahoma State Tech to be a decent heavy equipment mechanic. I thought it was going to be World War III, so I went in the Air Force instead and got a good job. I got out and I did come up here in 73 and graduated in, at Oklahoma State Tech. 75. I went to the Keystone equipment right after that and I've uh, been there ever since, which is about now 18 years. Started out as a mechanic, and probably like what a lot of you all would probably do when you, when you leave. Worked into uh, several years later, went into uh, field service, you know, field truck, one of the job sites, and, and uh, work on machines on, uh, on the job or the customer's job site or their, their repair shop. And uh, five years ago, then progressed a little bit more, turned into the service manager. Uh, did that for four years. And about a year ago, Keystone it's, it felt there was a need that if somebody went out and visited customers, do uh, a little public relations, kind of like in a little bit of uh, Jeff Egan's field is a product support, is what we call it, uh, customer service. Uh, visiting the customers, seeing what their needs are, uh, see if they have any problems, uh, maybe generate a little parts business or service business. And uh, it, uh, it, in the last year, uh, still a bit, so it's uh, 
it must have paid off. But we get a lot of response from our customers and our salesmen. The, the tractor salesmen will come back in and uh, comment that they noticed a lot of difference in their relationship with their customers. Uh, having a person like myself out there, so uh, it works out. So there's when you uh, you know when you leave here, you'll find that there's room for advancements in different areas. Uh, we understand there's a lot of communicating, or you've got communication skills that you learn here at the Oklahoma State Tech, math, uh, business principles, uh, psychology, I think you have courses like right that. Uh, all of these will make a difference uh, when you're, the little differences, while you're going through your, your, uh, your job skills or when you go to your next business or the next job. Uh, anyway, we'll get on into uh, what we're here for. Uh, we're going to talk about these teeth, but we kind of want to bring up, you know, you're going to school here, you've got uh, two years basically of some, of some kind of training, you go through uh, uh, engine courses, transmission courses, you know, you, uh, all the drive lines, hydraulics, and you know, we thought maybe, now I assume, or maybe you're all not, we're in construction business. Uh, uh, is everybody here in the construction line or any of you the truck mechanics? One, two. Okay. Uh, there's importance for the trucks. There's you know, what's the greatest thing. Or why, why, why have a truck? You know, you need a <coughs> tractor, trailer, and all that sort of stuff. But then you know, in construction equipment, you know, there's a purpose for it. We thought maybe we would ask you, what is the most important thing? about a construction piece of equipment. Got an idea? No, I don't know. Uh, maintenance? Yeah. Pull the regular maintenance on you know, your equipment's the most important? Yeah, it is. You mean what part of the most? Yeah, what part? Is most yeah, important? what would be the, what part, yeah, what uh, area of that machine is, is the most important? Is it the engine or transmission? Hydraulics? Got some heads yeah. nodding and for for what? What is the construction machinery going to do? Work. Work? What kind of work is it there for? Well, I'll, I'll give you some hints here. Most of any construction equipment is is you want to move earth, move earth, move earth. Uh, you're going to have a, a bucket, probably. You're going to have a grater. You're going to have a, a blade. You've got some kind of earth moving device on that piece of machinery. So uh, what we're going to say is the, since I'll, I'll help you out, <laughs> the uh, bucket tooth is going to be the most important thing. So that's where that's the job that tractor is designed to do, is to uh, dig a hole, is to uh, move dirt, the edge, the cutting edge or the bucket to is going to be the edge of this thing. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, sort of where we're going to pick up. Many people will agree, or if they, to one to one degree or another, they'll, they'll say that the bucket tooth or the cutting edge is probably the most important part of, a, of an earth moving machine, a piece of construction equipment. And the reason for that is because that's really where the work gets done, where the machine comes in contact with the dirt is at the bucket tooth or the cutting edge. And uh, so usually if that point of contact uh, is so important because that's where the work gets done, well apparently that contact area, because it's done with a bucket tooth, that's the most important part of the machine. Obviously, the machine's got to also have the engine and the transmission and all of the other components and systems in order to get those bucket teeth through, through the material properly. But we're going to spend our time talking about teeth, and we're going to probably get into maybe a lot more depth and detail than maybe any of you thought was even possible. But as I was kidding around a little while ago, it would take about five hours, and we think we might be able to get through all of this stuff. But uh, at least they allotted us five hours. They said, you guys would be anxious to sit around here for five hours. But we found out this morning that we got through in about three hours instead. So I hope you won't mind getting out of here two hours short of what you might expect. So we'll be finished by 3.30.
little, little joke there, guys. You might figure out real quickly that Lou and I are not really into having real formal training type sessions. So we're going to keep things very informal, which means that as we're talking about different topics or words or concepts or something, if there's something that doesn't quite bring through to you or you don't quite understand what we're talking about, we want to keep everybody feeling real informal and comfortable. So raise your hand or shout out your questions as they come to you. We'll try and clear things up. It's most important, I think, to make sure that you understand where we're coming from and what we're saying. Otherwise, if we lose you from the beginning, there's no chance that you'll ever come back in and pick anything up later on in the program. So we want to try and stay on the right wavelength and keep everything clear and easy for you to understand right from the get -go. Okay? We're talking about earth-moving equipment. And maybe to kind of help each of you visualize a little bit more clearly what we're going to be talking about quite a bit. Uh, we've got a section of videotape, just a couple of seconds long. It's not any real big time production or anything. But I'd just like to show it, and as, I, as it's being played up here on the TV screen, I'll kind of talk through it a little bit, and it'll give all of us a chance to look at the same picture and get a better idea of just exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about what bucket teeth are, where they're used on a machine, and how a machine is used to accomplish whatever work is that needs to get done as far as moving the, moving the dirt. Here's the machine coming in. This happens to be an excavator. And since Lou and I are both involved with John Deere, we uh, only have access to John Deere video tape. Here you can see the machine comes in and digs a bucket full of material, swings it over, and dumps it into the truck. Apparently the, the plan is that they're going to move that dirt someplace else. Here, notice you can see the bucket teeth across the bottom of the cutting edge of that bucket. And you can see that the bucket teeth are the first part of the machine to contact the material to, to help dig that bucket load of dirt. Now, depending on a lot of variables, a customer will determine how do we equip that particular machine when we talk about bucket team? And we'll talk about some of those variables a little bit later on. Some things like the type of material and the, yeah, the type of job he's trying to do, all of those things will enter in. So now what they're doing is backing that machine up and bringing another machine in and be doing basically the same thing. The machine just reaching out, taking a bucket load of material and then swinging it around and dumping it into the truck. So the thing that we're really concentrating on is the motion of the machine to reach out, contact the dirt, and dig through that dirt to get a nice full bucket of material and then move it wherever it's got to be moved. Okay, well, um, we were invited, obviously, to come here to OSU Tech today and spend some time talking with you about bucket teeth. So that's what we intend to do. And since OSU Tech is a school, campus where learning is supposed to take place, we figured that probably some part of what we're talking about should be in somehow related to learning and education. So we've got a couple of items that we've listed up here on the, on the uh, chalkboard that we'd like you to sort of take responsibility for learning by sitting through our presentation today. At the end of the program, you'll be able to do these three things. The first one says you'll be able to name two main purposes of bucket teeth. I don't, can anyone do that right now? Well, maybe that's something that we can look forward to learning. Then. Second one says you'll be able to name at least six ways to classify all of the bucket teeth. Just by way of comparison or by example, that table loaded with bucket teeth over there that Lou's standing in front of, when you look at that pile of teeth it may not appear to have any kind of organization whatsoever. But believe me, this is the scout's truth. Lou spent over 30 minutes yesterday afternoon arranging all of those teeth when we brought them up the stairs so that they were all in a certain particular order. So what that order is, only Lou knows right now. There is some, ways, some way that he classified all of those teeth. We'll look at six ways that you can understand different ways to classify teeth. The third item is to define at least two terms that relate to the bucket tooth industry. 
there may be quite a few words and phrases and terms that we'll throw out and use in talking about different points of, uh, of the discussion. Maybe some of those words and terms will be brand new to you. There's a real good chance that that might happen based on what happened this morning. So we'd like you to at least be able to pick up two terms that you uh, have heard for the first time today and then you have a better understanding of what they are. Uh, oh, you have, okay. This morning we were pretty lucky. We had a fairly good sized group, which is not really saying that a big group is better than a small group by any means. But the thing about that big group was that there were a couple of people in there that helped us out quite a bit. Um, OSU Tech isn't paying us an awful lot of money to do all of the talking up here, so we're going to expect you guys to help us out. Have you guys do some of the talking from time to time, too. So you kind of keep that in mind. We don't want to take all that responsibility all by ourselves. Uh, we'll work on this outline sheet a little bit. Well, pretty much as we go along, we'll, we'll more or less follow those topics and address it in just a few minutes. Uh, right now, I'd like to lay a question on you that maybe you're wondering about. And the question is, why would somebody like me, who works for John Deere, a tractor manufacturing company, and a person like Lou, who works for an equipment dealership, why would we be involved in something that appears to be fairly insignificant, like a bucket team? Why would we be willing to think that it might be worth three hours of your time to come in and listen to us talk about something like what is it about the topic of bucket team that may be of concern to all of us? Do you have any ideas? Certainly that's got to be one of the main reasons. There's really two reasons. That's one of them. Actually, that was the second one I was going to mention. Um, the first one is the fact that, obviously, being a John Deere employee, I'm interested in, in customers buying John Deere machines and being satisfied with them. When all is said and done, one of the most important things that, that, that we as a business, as a John Deere business, are involved in or interested in is making sure the customers are satisfied. If we can keep all of our customers completely satisfied when they purchase a piece of John Deere machinery, then the chances are real good that they'll buy additional machines from John Deere in the future. Who is probably the same way. If Keystone Equipment keeps all of their customers satisfied through repeat business alone, they're going to have a long and successful time in the, business, in the field of business. Um, let me paint a little story of, of what might happen and see if this makes any sense to me. Uh, let's say that we sell a piece of equipment to a customer, regardless of brand or anything like that. We're not here to promote the John Deere line necessarily, it's just that that's what our experience level comes from. But, so we, we'll probably be talking about John Deere, but let's say it could be any brand of equipment. The customer buys that particular piece of equipment and then Let's say that he starts to use inferior quality filters and uses inferior quality oil and uses poor quality fuel and uses low quality uh, teeth and cutting edges and he doesn't follow the prescribed methods of, of uh, periodic maintenance and he doesn't take real good care of that piece of equipment. Is there a good chance that maybe that machine will not perform up to its capabilities for this guy? Yeah, there's a real good chance of that. And if the machine doesn't perform the way it was designed to perform, do you think the customer is going to be satisfied with it and happy with that performance? Probably not. Probably not. And if a customer has one of my pieces of equipment and he's not satisfied with it, well, then there's a real good chance that when the time comes for him to replace that machine with another one, he's not going to buy the next one from me. He's going to go someplace else. So as much as possible, what I want to do is I want to try and make sure that the customer is as satisfied as he possibly can be so that machine works as good as it possibly can and one way to do that is by being very concerned with the, other, with the wear and the maintenance items that the customer is using making sure that the quality of those items is, is toward the top of the scale so that they'll help the machine achieve its potential bucket teeth is just one of those wear items that we're going to that's going to be a lot of concern to many customers so we're going to spend some time looking at all of the different variety of teeth because the choice of teeth that a customer chooses to put on his machine 
those teeth can go a long way to determine whether that machine is going to work in a positive way or a negative way for that customer and determine whether he's happy or, or not happy with the way that it performs. So that's one idea. The fact that, that the teeth are very important to the overall satisfaction that the customer receives from his machine. And the second point is the point that you made for us earlier. And that is the fact that there's some money to be made in this business. In fact, each year, there's approximately $240 million that customers spend on bucket teeth, which is a pretty good amount of money, I think. I don't know, maybe some of you are financially better off than I am, but for me, if I had $240 million, I'd be pretty satisfied. But anyway, if there's $240 million that customers are ready to spend each year, certainly by taking an interest in the bucket tooth market, there's a chance for us to tap into a portion of that potential out there. So that's certainly important to us. This is a slide represents a, just a small sample of some of the many, many teeth that are available through John Deere. Of course, John Deere is just one of many suppliers of bucket teeth also. Many of, you might look and see many similarities between some of these teeth, and you also may notice a couple of differences. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time looking at both the similarities and the differences to find out why there are similarities and differences to such a large degree in all the teeth in the, in, in the industry. One thing we're going to talk about, in fact, it was the second item mentioned up here on the list, is we'll talk about six ways to classify teeth. One way to classify teeth we're going to mention right here now, right off the top, right off the top of the program. Teeth could be classified in one of two ways, either a one-piece tooth, as is pictured here, or a two-piece <laughs> two tooth system. And this is a picture of a two-piece tooth system. This is much more common than the one-piece design, so we're going to spend the vast majority of our time concentrating on the two-piece system. And even the name two-piece is really not completely accurate because as you can see, we have one piece, another piece, and then there's also a third piece. So I guess really, if you want to be technical about it, this would really be a three-piece system. But we'll call it the two-piece system because the two main components are this component here and this component here. Does anybody know what this component here is called? Well, here's one of those terms that we talked about up here. This item right here is called a shank, or some people call it an adapter. So either word is, can be used to describe what this item is. The shank, or the adapter, fits permanently, relatively permanently, to the cutting edge of the machine's bucket. The cutting edge goes right in this opening right here, so the shank fits up over it. It's either welded in place or it's bolted in place, and pretty much, as I said, permanently fixed to the to the, the bucket. By contrast, this component, the tooth, or sometimes people refer to this as the tip, T-I-P, the tip fits over this end of the shank and protects the shank and also protects the rest of the bucket. Very normal operate and it's held in place by this little piece of hardware that's a pin in this, in this instance, roll pin or flex pin, there's several different types of pins that are used. But anyway, the, the tooth fits over the shank, and during normal operation, the, the bucket is going to be pulled through material, so there's going to be a lot of abrasion between the material and that bucket. And during that abrasion, that's going to create wear. In normal operation, the tooth is designed to absorb all of the wear. And by absorbing the wear, it protects the shank, and it protects the bucket, and, all, and the cutting edge, and anything else that may be back beyond that. Here's a picture of a shank, a tooth, and a pin, so that you can see the real life components, what they look like. Before we move on and get into teeth, we'll spend a minute here looking at a couple of different types of adapters that are available in a few more terms also. Here we have a, what's called a two-strap adapter. The straps are these portions right here. This has a full strap that goes over the top of the cutting edge and a full strap that goes on the bottom of the cutting edge. Some people, instead of the word strap, will use the word leg. So this would be a two-strap or a two-leg design. Over on this side, we have a strap and a half or a leg and a half with the full strap or leg up on the top side of the cutting edge or along the bottom side of the cutting edge. Once again, strap and a half or leg and a half. 
Over here we have a flush design where the there's one leg on the top of the cutting edge and then no leg down on the bottom side of the cutting edge. Sometimes, depending on the work and the, the uh, material and the type of machine that's being used, the customer may choose different types of shanks in order to get his job done the right way. For example, if the customer is in a loader, in a, in a loading type application where he's using his machine and the loader bucket to go into a pile or a, or a bank and dig a bucket load and tip it back to load the bucket, sometimes he'll want to maintain a nice smooth surface on the floor where he's working on the ground. And if he's got a strap and a half design where the strap is on the underside of that cutting edge on the underside of the bucket, each time he moves the bucket into that pile, he's going to be leaving ridges where those will dig into the ground. If he doesn't want to have that, then he can use this type of a shank where the, the mounting of the shank is up on top of the cutting edge and that leaves the bottom of the cutting edge nice and flat. So when it skims across the ground, it's leaving a nice smooth surface for him. Okay, that's just one example of how the different varieties of shanks can be used. And it's one of the many choices and decisions that the customers have to make in regard to their bucket tube and shank. Here's a picture of a one-piece design over here and an assembled two-piece design over on the right-hand side. As I mentioned, the two-piece system is much more common than the one-piece system, so we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about that one-piece, or I'm sorry, the two-piece system over on the right-hand side. Okay, a little pause in the action. I'd like you to, to direct you to your outline sheet right now for a moment or two. Look at Roman number one, number one, we've got a question there to ask, what are the two main purposes of bucket tea? Any ideas? Oh, for digging. For digging? Okay. That's one, maybe. Well, well, that's sort of an overlying umbrella that fits over all of what we're going to be talking about. Purposes of a bucket tooth? There's Two of them, A and B. One is, well, let's look at the slide. See what we have on the slide. Basically two things, and this is very, very important. If you, if you pick up nothing else today, we want at least that you go away knowing these two important bits of information. The two purposes of a bucket tube. The first one is to penetrate the material, which basically is to dig, just like what you said. Bucket tube, the purpose is to penetrate the material, why do we penetrate the material? Well, as the slide says, so that we can get maximum bucket fill with minimum power. But the real key point is to penetrate the material. The second purpose is to protect the cutting edge or protect the bucket. The reason customers will use bucket teeth on their machines are for these two reasons. One of the challenges that's con that, we, that customers are continually faced with is to try and figure out what's the best choice of tooth to use that's going to help me accomplish both of these tasks at the same time. I want to have, if I'm a customer, I want to have a tooth that's going to be sharp enough and, and pointed and narrow enough to penetrate whatever material I have to dig in, but at the same time I want the, a tooth that's going to be beefy and bulky enough so it's going to provide the protection to protect my cutting edge and my bucket. So where's the trade-off? Well, the, the bulkier I get in trying to get more protection for my bucket, the less that same tooth is going to provide penetration. And the opposite is true, too. The, the more I strive to get better penetration, the trade-off is that I'm going to get less and less protection for the bucket and the cutting, bucket and the cutting edge. Let me ask you this, does that make sense to you? That's the challenge, the ongoing challenge your customers always face when looking at bucket teeth. Let me ask you a question, why is it important to protect the cutting edge? Because the bucket does more than the teeth. Absolutely. So that's why when a customer puts bucket teeth on his bucket, that's exactly why he's doing it. One of the reasons why he's doing it is because it's a lot cheaper to take those bucket teeth and replace those than it is to let the bucket or the cutting edge absorb all of the wear and then replace the bucket. So the 
there's a cost factor in there. Whenever we can do something that helps a customer make or save money, that's what we're striving to do because that's going to help the customer be more satisfied. Okay? Purpose of the team. You notice that's the number one learning point that we had up here. Maybe two main purposes of teeth, protect the bucket, penetrate the material. And we'll say that same thing several times yet before we roll out to the end of the program today. Okay, I'd like to direct you to Roman numeral number two on the outline sheet now. Another question. There's a total of questions today. What are the three major expectations of teeth in normal operation? This is from the customer's point of view. What does a customer expect the bucket teeth to do? for him. Okay, last a long time. Uh, when you say last a long time, that kind of encompasses two of the points here. Well, really, it encompasses all three of them, I think. The ones, the thoughts that I had down, well, does anybody have a comment on the first one? Do you have an idea of what one of the three major expectations customers have? Kids? Are? I forget where my, that's my verb is. Okay, one of them, the notes that I have is the first one, probably the most important, is that customers expect the tooth to do the job, which basically means what we just talked about, protect the bucket and also penetrate the material. So doing the job, that's probably the first thing the customers expect of their bucket to. Second thing is, tying in the comment you made to last a long time, is to resist wear. Remember we, we made the comment that teeth are designed to absorb wear. That's their purpose. One of their main purposes is to absorb the wear so that they can protect the other components that are not designed to wear. So the longer or the more that the tooth is able to resist wear, the longer it'll last and the better off it'll be for the customer. Third point is to resist breaking. Teeth are designed to wear, but they are not designed to break. So anytime we have a tooth that breaks, in essence what happens is that a portion of that tooth that remain or remains is simply thrown away because we can't use the tooth after it breaks. And if there's usable metal material there that otherwise could have worn away rather than break away, we don't get to use that. So it's money down the drain. So it's money wasted by the customer. So certainly we don't want to see that. <coughs> if we can avoid breakage and resist wear so that the tooth will wear a long, long time before its life is done, that's the most optimum situation that we can hope for, and that's what most customers expect out of their bucket team, is to do the job, resist wear, resist breaking, so they can be wrong for a long time to do, the, do that job. Talking about tooth wear, let's look at what happens when a tooth wears, just for a few moments. This picture right up here, the outside red line represents the original shape of this tooth. And as you can see, as wear occurs, it keeps getting smaller and smaller, but at the same time, notice that the original profile is still maintained. This is an example of the type of wear that's supposed to occur in normal operations. As I said, teeth are designed to wear, but they're designed to wear in a particular way. They should maintain their original profile through their entire wear life. Um, if the operator <coughs> You, if, if this was a, a good choice of tooth for this particular job application, and if the operator uses the tooth and operates the machine in the proper ways, then there's a good chance that this is the type of wear pattern that will occur, and that's very desirable. If this wear pattern is maintained, remember the two main important, most important things about a tooth, is to penetrate the material and protect the buck, right? Well, you notice the point right here that's still maintained even as wear is occurring. Is this tooth going to continue to penetrate the material as it lives through its life, would you suppose? Pretty well, because that point is still pretty much the same as it was when it was new. Okay, so this is desirable wear. It's based on good operator techniques and also the right tooth and the right job application, good choice of teeth. By comparison, let's look down here. This is a wrong choice of tooth or a tooth that's being misused by an operator. The original profile is right here, same as up here. But notice how wear, when wear occurs, how the profile is being changed. What happens right here? What happened to that point? It's gone, isn't it? It's worn off. One of two things. Either this is, a, is not the best choice of 
two for this particular job application, or maybe the operator is operating the machine in a way that's not most desirable, not beneficial. And I can explain that to you kind of easily. In normal digging applications, like on the excavator that we saw on the videotape, I'll try and simulate that motion right up here. My arm will be the bucket, and the bucket tooth, this is the surface of the ground to represent what my arm. You can follow all this. Good luck. Normal operation would, would be the, the bucket to be penetrating the material, something like this, and then digging like that to fill the bucket. You follow that? We come through to take a bucket fill. We, we penetrate through the surface of the material and then come back like this. Sometimes, in some applications, operators of an excavator or a backhoe, if they're, they're uh, spreading material, instead of doing a digging type piercing motion like that with the bucket, they may take the bucket and do this type of an action right here where they're scraping along to maintain a flat bottom. Maybe the bottom of the ditch to kind of clean up the last pass or something, or spreading material. If they got a pile of material, they want to spread it out in an area. They may do something like this and spread the material. In situations like that, instead of the normal wear that should occur on that bucket tube, which would be even on the underside and also the top side, to help maintain that profile, we're getting sort of like taking a pencil eraser and just rubbing it across the sidewalk. We're just pulling it flat right there. And that, in essence, is going to round off that bucket tube, similar to this picture here. The bucket well, the, some would do it and maintain a sharper edge than others. In fact, I can give you a pretty good example. This particular tooth right here is a, it's a shape that was fairly recently introduced, about two years ago, introduced by John Deere. And this is another tooth that's been around for years and years and years. The type of thing that I just explained, where it kind of drags a tooth like that, maybe drags it. Well, no, just the opposite, just the opposite. It would last a long time, but as you can see, because it's so thick here, it doesn't take too long to if you start wearing, like my finger is moving in this direction here. And that's pretty much the pattern that this type of wear or operation is going to create. We're going to wear it pretty much straight back. You can see that before long, this is going to be pretty blunt. And that was some of the experiences that we found when these were first introduced about two years ago. It's because this is so thick, going to end up getting real blunt. It's going to, some people say it looks like a fist coming out of the shank. Whereas this one, even though it might wear the same way, flat, going back, because this is so much narrower, when this wears a half an inch back from the point, compared to this wearing half an inch back from the point, this one is going to be a lot blunter, I think you can see, just because of the thickness, the height of those two different teeth. Okay. Basically, uh, what the way he was uh, picturing uh, one type of way, which is maybe blunting their tooth, uh, I don't think any tooth is going to stay sharp. You know, no. Uh, that they're having to take Yeah. If yeah, the guy's got to do it yeah. that way, he would scratch out the bottom of the tooth or something like that. Now, so I just want to make sure that I, I leave you with a clear impression here. This one will last longer. There's no question about that because there's more material. Yeah. But it will not penetrate as well as where it occurs because it's thicker. Or this one may not last as long, but it will remain sharper as where it occurs. Okay? Okay, so wear is good. That's by design. Breakage is not good. Here's a little continuation of tooth wear. We have a brand new tooth on a brand new shank, and notice how the, the tooth completely fits over the shank, and this area right here is all the shank inside the bucket tooth. Uh, yeah, inside the bucket tooth. Let's take a look at what that looks like in real life. Here's an example of a shank, and here's a tooth. And what we're talking about is having a nice, solid, secure fit. This is very, very important to make sure that the shank and the tooth fit together on all sides with as little wobble as possible. Because the snugger the fit we get, the better off we're going to be. 
might notice on here I've made a couple of marks with a felt tip pen on all four corners that match up to the four corners inside the tube. Sort of like uh, uh, four legs of a table. What happens if one of the legs is shorter than the other three? What's two, or what's the end two? What's the table going to do? It's going to rock and wobble, right? Same thing would be true of a bucket tooth and a shank. If we don't have good contact at all of those four locations, it's going to wobble around an awful lot. And that's what we want to avoid. Because anytime there's wobble, there's a chance that that tooth is going to break. So it's very important that that contact is maintained in all four corners, not just on the top, but also on the back side as well. And not just on the back side, but also on both sides. We want to make sure that there's good contact on all four sides so we don't have wobble this way, and we also don't have wobble this way. If we have a loose fit in any one of those areas, then there's a chance where, where it's going to lead to breakage of the teeth. And as we said, anytime we break a tooth, we're throwing away usable material, and that's a waste of money. So we want to try and avoid that whenever possible. Okay, so desirable wear, or, or good wear, I'm sorry, brand new tooth and a brand new shank, and as wear occurs, we end up with a picture that looks something like this. The tooth is taking on all the wear like it's supposed to do. And we get to a point here where the shank is not exposed yet. There's still some material left on the tooth that's protecting that shank. And this is a time that, that that tooth should be replaced. What we do not want to do is wait until after the wear goes all the way through the tooth and exposes the shank and starts to wear out the shank. And that's what's happened in this situation. Remember that shank came down to a point, and that part portion of the shank is gone. It's worn away. There's nothing there. So if we take that same shank and put a new tooth on it, that's what we're showing here. You look right here where the shank portion of the shank wore away. We've got a little pocket down there of air where there's a bad fit between the tooth and the shank. And what's going to happen is this is used in operation. Dirt is going to get force down and it's going to collect down in that pocket. It's going to keep building up and before too long it's going to probably lead to breaking of that new tooth. So the thing to keep in mind is to always replace the teeth at the proper time. And the proper time is after they've lived out their useful life and before they've worn out so far where the shank is exposed to wear. So we always want to avoid wear on the shanks. Don't. Worn shanks and new teeth can, lose, can lead to broken teeth. For example, right here is an example of a, a break in this area of the tooth. Could occur if we use the tooth on a, uh, on a worn shank. In essence, what happens sometimes is that, and let me backtrack, there's a combination maybe of a worn shank and a new tooth, and then also compounded by an operator who may not be operating the the machine in the proper way. Let's say we have a worn shank and a new tooth. And then let's say that we've got an operator that instead of digging like this, he's in some real hard material. So he just takes that bucket and he decides to bang it up and down a couple of times to try and break up the material. It's not uncommon. Sometimes people use whatever tool is handy. Sometimes if an operator is, has got the responsibility to move some material and he can't penetrate any other way, he'll maybe try and get by by misusing it whatever tool, which is the machine, to try to get the job done. But that's part of real life. But the result of that, that carries a consequence, and here's what the consequence is. Remember we have wear on the shank, the new tube. So every time that operator bangs that bucket down, what he's doing is he's banging that shank into that space that's left by the area that was worn away, and banging it into the bottom of the pocket of that tube. So it's bang, bang, forcing through eventually he might just drive that shank right through the bottom of that tooth in this area right here and crack that tooth. So it's a combination maybe of a, a worn shank plus misuse or abuse of the machine. Uh, another situation of breakage is a break like this in this area right here and the way that that might occur is if a tooth is used upside down. This particular tooth, can you blame me a little bit? One more time, see what I can. Uh, <clears throat> Remember the, the way that this thing operates is the cutting edge and the bucket fit right in this slot here. Excuse 
you, the uh, digging forces of the machine are pulling the tooth and the shank in this direction like this toward me, trying to get a buck full of material. The dirt is creating a resistance right here on the lip of the bucket and on the bucket too. So there's force pushing this way. The machine is trying to pull against that force this way. So what happens is the force of the machine pulling is being on the inside of this particular piece of metal right here, which is thick and substantial and it's built to take it. If we turn that tooth around and put it on backwards, now when we start to pull against that resistance of the dirt, we can see that we can probably pull this clip right off of the base because you, if you look closely, I can show you that this is welded onto this piece. And the forces are so great when we start pulling the tooth through the material that that's exactly what can happen is a tooth can literally get pulled right apart. So if we put a tooth on upside down, sometimes we can lead to breakage like this. Then the third example is a situation where, remember we're supposed to have a pin that goes through both holes all the way through the tooth, something like this right here. If one side comes loose, then all of the digging forces that are supposed to be balanced between that pin on both sides of the tooth and the shank, all of those forces are concentrated on just one side, on one hole. And as the bucket pulls through the material, all that force on one pin hole is too much for the tooth to handle, and it literally rips the tooth apart right at that pin hole. And that's what can happen with break, something like that. So those are some of the examples of how tooth breakage can occur. And as we said, tooth breakage is something that we always want to try and avoid. One way we can avoid that is by good operating techniques. Another way is by making sure that we never put new teeth on worn shanks. So we always want to do whatever we can to avoid wear on the shanks. We talked about um, ways that wear can occur on shanks. One is if we don't replace our teeth in time. Another situation is if uh, an operator may be out running the machine and something happens and he loses one of his teeth. Well, it doesn't take long if he continues to work that machine to experience some wear on that exposed shank because the shanks are not very hard. They're not heat treated or anything. So just a couple of cycles can result in some wear on the shanks. So as soon as a, an operator notices that he's lost a bucket tooth, he should as quickly as possible get out there and replace that tooth so that he protects that exposed shank. Otherwise, he'll get some wear on that shank, and then eventually, it's probably going to lead to other tooth troubles for him. So if you do have more wear on a shank, it's a good idea to just replace that shank and on the business end. Okay, back to the outline sheet. We're up to number three already. Um, when we come, we're going to take a little bit of a break right now, but when we come back, we're going to pick up on Roman numeral number three. We're going to talk about some of the ways to classify bucket teeth. <coughs> and that's when we'll start to look and see what kind of, of uh, thinking was going through Lou's mind when he got that pile of teeth set over on that day in the afternoon. Let's review where we are so up to this point before we break for, for a couple of minutes and then we'll come back and get at it some more. Look at the two main purposes of bucket teeth, and what are they? Very good. We also talked about the three major expectations of bucket teeth, and they are... Excellent. Excellent. Okay, when we come back, we'll pick up with Roman over number three, and we'll look at ways to classify them. We want to... Well, okay, we did this for the first group and they kind of enjoyed it. So we'll, uh, we've got a little segment of videotape that sort of can be used to lead us into the coffee break. So we'll pop it on and see what happens. Stupid dog with the long ears, the 
across the same thing. I had got into it when I started putting it down.
And then six and seven kind of blend together. We have design or how they're attached. That's the tooth attached to the shank. And oftentimes that's determined by the supplier. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in the next item uh, up on discussion. What we're going to talk about first, if you look at your outline sheet, we're on Roman numeral number three, ways to classify bucket teeth. Letter A says tooth design or tooth style. It's just the same, or different words to say basically the same thing. And we talk, when we talk about tooth design, that's one way that we're going to use to classify teeth. And what we're talking about, the tooth design, is the, the shape of this pocket on the tooth in comparison to the shape of the shank. Because remember what we said earlier, the shank and the tooth must fit together to create a nice snug fit. So obviously if the shank is round and the pocket of the tooth is square, we're not going to get a very good fit, are we? So obviously what we want to do is make sure that we have a specific style of shank and that same style of pocket on the tooth so we can get that good fit. Now there's several different styles or designs of teeth and shanks. And one question that you might have is the question I'm going to ask you, why do you suppose there's a variety of different styles of teeth available in the marketplace? Do you have any idea? Different source, did you say? Yeah, clay and sand. Oh, no, that, no, that, that doesn't have an impact on, on what we're talking about here with, the, with the, the mating between the shank and the tooth. So the type of soil is more concerned, that's more of a concern for the, the, the outside shape of the tooth, what we refer to as the business end of the tooth, the part that actually penetrates into the dirt. So we'll talk, we'll, what we refer to is tooth shape, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about tooth shape. What we're talking about right now is tooth style or tooth design, and that's where we're talking about the inside pot right there. Like, like this right here, or this right here, or that one there? Yeah, these are different sizes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other. Yeah, there yeah, we're getting into the size, but still, still there's the basic shape of the shank and the shape of the tooth that come together. Okay? Let me explain kind of what happened in the, well, there are, well, there, there are several varieties of shapes, and, I'm sorry, there are several varieties of styles or designs of shanks and teeth. And let me explain, if I can, kind of what happened in the business. Um, there, were, there were different suppliers, different manufacturers of teeth and shanks. And remember we said there's $240 million worth of business year out there? Well, if I was a tooth supplier, I'd like to get as big a, a big a portion of that $240 million as I possibly could. So one way where I might be able to try and do that is if I, as a tooth manufacturer, if I was able to create a unique style of shank that nobody else had, and then the teeth that would match onto that shank, then I could take that unique style unique design, I could patent that so no one else could manufacture it. Then if I went out into the marketplace and I convinced a lot of customers to install my unique style of shanks on their machines, then where are those people going to have to go every time they need replacement teeth? They're going to have to come back to me, aren't they? Well, let's say that I do exactly that. And unbeknownst to me, my old buddy Lou over here, he's a uh, bucket tooth manufacturer also, and he's doing the same type of thing. He developed his own unique style of shank, teeth to fit it. He went out and contacted a bunch of customers, did exactly the same job, patent on his style, and off he went. <coughs> so, all the while those patents are in effect, nobody else can manufacture teeth to fit on my shanks, and nobody can manufacture teeth to fit on loose shanks. So I've got my customers, he's got his. Well, after so many years, and I can't remember exactly how many years it is, uh, but after so many years, the patents will run out, which means that I no longer have the exclusive opportunity to manufacture my style. And when the patent runs out, that means that any tooth supplier, tooth manufacturer, can start to manufacture tooth teeth that will fit on my style of shanks. In fact, they can even manufacture the shanks because it's just that 
mating system that, that I had the patent for. So let's see. Same thing happens to my patent about the same time as it happens to Lou's patent. So all those customers that I had nicely tucked away as, as uh, repeat customers to buy teeth only from me, all of a sudden I find out that now Lou has started to manufacture teeth that will fit on my shanks that I sold to my customers. So some of my customers are now buying their replacement teeth from Lou. So I don't like that too well, so I start manufacturing teeth that will fit on the shanks that Lou used to have exclusive rights to. Are you following the sense behind what's going on here? Well, basically that's what has gone on in real life in the tooth industry over the years. Companies develop a unique shape of a, or style of shank. They develop the teeth that will match. <coughs> fit on those shanks, they get a patent, and the patent is good for X number of years, however long that is. And while that patent is in effect, nobody else can interfere with that business, so they pretty much lock up the marketplace. And we'll talk about several companies that have done that. Well, as a result of that, once those patents run out, then we find ourselves in the situation we're at right now with the buck tooth industry. We have several different styles or designs of teeth and shanks that are out there and different customers have different styles of teeth and maybe some customers, in fact this is true, some customers don't even know that there are differences between one style and one, another style and a third style and some people think that the same tooth could fit on virtually any machine based on the machine brand but that's not the case, not the, not the accurate situation. Okay, so just to uh, show you all this real quick here, before we get into who makes what, you see some difference in there. And then here's your mating teeth. You know, I'll these over there. These go, this one go on here, and that goes on there. You might see some differences. And then there's other manufacturers that do. Obviously, that won't fit on any of these shanks. And this is a little different yet. One that uh, Jess been holding up so the slider. It's the smallest one in the bunch. <laughs> it's got a different style. Yeah. And we'll get into naming them in a little bit. But that's one of those important things you need to know when you're out there for to replace teeth or if you replace a shank, you know, is uh, you want to match them up or get something else. You know, you know, so there are some differences there. Here's a tooth for those over there. I don't have shanks for these, but here's a different, different style inside. Obviously, that sure looks different. More than being chosen. Anyway. Now, the next task is can you match the right tooth on the right shank? I remember getting stumped by that one when I was a kid, right? <laughs> Square peg and round ball, triangular plug. Okay, that's a whole different story. Okay, let's talk about several of the styles or designs that are available in the marketplace. First one we'll talk about is this style right here that, like Lou said, I've been carrying around most of the day with me. This particular style was developed by a company by the name of H&L. Maybe some of you have heard of them. Home office is just up the road, up in Tulsa. And they developed what they called their pocket style. And this is an example of the pocket style. It's flat on the, all four sides and tapered down to pretty much of a, a, a point. And obviously the pocket of the teeth that fit this pocket style is, is the same general shape, so they match together. As Lou was pointing out, a different, a different style of shank will not adapt or will not uh, accept this tooth and this tooth won't fit on any other type of shank, style of shank, except for another pocket style of shank. So the pocket style was first developed by H&L. For a period of years the patent was in effect so no one else could sell this particular style except H&L. So they locked up a certain amount of that marketplace. Then we got to a point where the patent ran out and then other people start to manufacture teeth and sell teeth made of this style, and that's where we are right now today. Uh, 
there's a lot of different tooth suppliers who are selling pocket style teeth that originally were developed by HML. HML can sit back and say, well, that's the way she goes. But HML is not alone. There's a lot of other teeth manufacturers that are in the same position. And, and to elaborate or stretch that, these are obviously our little teeth. Uh, we can numb them. They, they number those. So like the, they call them 230, or we don't call them a 23 series. And then you just start making them bigger. You go to 24, 25. Same thing, pocket style teeth. And you've got the same idea inside with the shape of the tooth to match. And then you start getting larger. That's why you basically right in here are HML design shape styles, pocket styles. Right and John Deere basically claims the pocket style as John Deere teeth too, so they use it more than another brand. And the reason for that is because that was, in years gone by, that was sort of the, the style that John Deere adopted with all of their teeth as they came up. The HL pocket style was already in existence long before that. And John Deere just decided to sort of try and make things a little more uniform, that they would adopt one style, and that was the style years ago that they first adopted. Since that time, we've changed and we don't have just one style anymore. Far from it. Another company is Hensley. Hensley, as you can see, has a variety of different shapes of teeth. It's a picture of the teeth. But Hensley, man, or Hensley created a style of teeth called parabolic. And this is in your outline sheet under Roman numeral three, letter A, number two, parabolic style. Hensley is the company name. Just above it is the pocket style from H&L. Parabolic style, uh, just like H&L, Hensley developed the style. No one else could manufacture it for a number of years. After so many years, the patent has run out, so now virtually anybody who's interested in manufacturing parabolic style teeth has got the okay to do it legally. There's nothing to keep you from. It's called parabolic. As you see here on this, dished out, you know, on the shape, it's got the mating surface in the tooth. It's kind of convex, I suppose. Convex here, concave there. Up. So that's the Hensley style. They patented it years ago. And as Jeff said, it's run out. Now anybody can make them. And when a lot of people talk about the Hensley style tooth, they're, they're talking about the parabolic design of their, their shape into the tooth. So there's that. Well, now that you know that name, I'm going to put a little closer up. I'm going to pass it around and not to you or look at it. Not to tell it. Throw your back out your head or something. Here's another style, uh, or another company, was is Esco Tooth Manufacturer. They developed a style called Conical Style. Who's got an example of those? This is kind of an interesting story, Lou. Well, Lou, Shane? Okay, well, before we get there, the conicals, you see it's kind of like a cone shape. It's Round is basically just about the opposite of, uh, of the Hensley. They, uh, they're cut or combed inside, and as you can see, the shank is that design also, so you can match them up like this. Now, as I was thinking what uh, Jeff was talking about, or what was interesting is this an Esco tooth or an Esco shank. I mean, yeah, Esco shape, conical, Esco design. There we go. That's right. Uh, conical uh, design, Esco conical. I guess you'd say it's, it's synonymous. Anyway, the, is he saying the uh, patents run out? Well, if you look on this, if you're going to pass it around, it's got Hensley stamped on it. Well, Hensley can make a Esco design or a conical design tooth now. It's the same thing as. Uh, John Deere is actually having these teeth made. Not, they're not made. These probably aren't made by Esco. That is that conical design. It fits on there. And this one, this shank has happened to be purchased through Hensley. So if you start talking Hensley, Esco, you'll get mixed up because you say, well, that's a Hensley shank. Well, it is and it isn't. <laughs> it's called a conical design. Uh, Hensley actually 
manufactured that particular shot. Anyone who wants to see this particular conical design? See how they fit in there? And if you're starting to get a little bit confused on all of this, don't feel bad because virtually everybody else gets confused when they start talking about bucket teeth also. Customers included. People, it's, it's amazing. I've talked with some people who their livelihood depends on operating their equipment and using bucket teeth. And a lot of these terms they've never heard before. So I'm kind of surprised to realize that. But. And that's one reason why we're here is uh, uh, help you all when you get out in the field to you know, say, oh, I know what that is. That's a conical design. And you've got to have to have a conical design too. You go on that shank. Or a pair of bottles. Right, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, okay. Parabolic tooth on a cat style shank. No, that doesn't do it that way. Because as we found out, Hensley can't make cat teeth. Uh, the shanks have to match. Yeah. And you, the, that's the, style, the style of the tooth much, must match the yeah. style of the shank. That's, yeah. The, yeah, that's, the, that's the point we're trying to get through. But it, it gets very confusing, doesn't it? Yeah. Or it can. So that's why I'm, I'm working real hard. Both Lou and I are trying to make sure that we're using the right term at the right time. Even that sounds a little odd. Because it's it's the style or the design that we're really concentrating on with this little bit. Uh, this, this, this little bit. Uh, it's, you end up to find out it's something that maybe you're used to. If, uh, if you've always used a, uh, a conical style, that's what you might, if you're the uh, operator, I mean the owner of that machine, when you order the machine, you may say, oh, well, I, want to, I want you to put a uh, conical style teeth on it. Or they like this style, the parabolic. Or we do have guys who want the cat style on their John Deere tractor. So you really have, you have them all in one. Yeah, we do. But it's, yeah, it comes from a preference, and that could be availability. Uh, the guy says, I, I've got availability of uh, the parabolic teeth, or I have the conical or the cat. And uh, so he may go that way. Uh, price, it could, that could mean something to him, where all of them are probably comparable in price, you talk about the size, uh, probably comparable. That may not make a difference to him. Uh, but maybe the, the first one, like service, or what he's used to, and he's used to that style of design, that would be a design of the shape. You know, just like you said, you could have a caterpillar with a hinge bucket and conical teeth. Like Everybody adequately confused now? Okay, so good. good. That's, that was our mission, was to make sure we got you confused. <laughs> so, so we'll find out there's more. <laughs> okay, well here's the, the ones that we've talked about so far, the various styles we've discussed so far, those are all ones that originally had the patents on them. The patents have run out, so now it's pretty much open game. Virtually anyone can offer any of those styles we've talked about so far. Now, starting with this slide here, we're going to talk about three styles that still have patents in effect. So no one other than the company that holds the patent can offer these particular teeth in the marketplace, these particular styles of teeth. This one was produced or created by ESCO. This is called the Twist Lock, as you can read as easy as I can. Um, they're unique in the fact that there's no additional hardware that's needed to secure the tooth to the shank. The unfortunate thing from ESCO's point of view is the fact that people in the marketplace just have not decided that this was something that they wanted to use. So they're still, Esco is still in a position where they're trying to get customers to buy into this particular style. And customers so far have been reluctant. So that's kind of where this one stands. Uh, so Twist Lock has not been a real good success story for that very reason. On the other hand, Esco also has two other designs Heel lock and the vertical lock, and these have caught on and, and gained a little more popularity on the marketplace. So there are some customers that are using these particular styles. So it looks like these will probably continue. Who knows what might happen with that twist lock, with the previous lock? An interesting thing about the heel lock and vertical lock is that the same teeth will fit either style shank. They're identical teeth. The difference is in the shanks. Here's a heel lock. Shank. Here's a vertilock shank. You can tell the difference between because the vertilock shanks have a hole in them right there, and that's and uh, the other difference is the hardware that's used to hold the teeth in place. Heel lock. I think I might have a slide. No, I guess not. Not now. Later on. The heel lock has a metal horseshoe. Uh, okay. We call it quadrilock. More terms, special words that you've never heard before, probably. It's got a quadrilock that slides down and holds the tooth onto the shank. The vertilock has a little spring-loaded plug and a, just a straight little metal bar about the length of my finger and use together those attach and hold the tooth onto the vertilock shank. So we can, we'll look at those a little bit later on the picture in your mind what we're talking about. OK, 
Okay, that brings us to the end of the discussion on tooth styles or tooth designs. Before we forge into the next topic, does anybody have any questions about tooth designs or tooth styles? We started this discussion on this particular area by asking you, why are there so many varieties out there in the marketplace? Can you answer that question now? How did it ever get started?
when we're talking about tooth style or tooth design, we were talking about the patents and how people could lock up portions of the market based on their patents of their unique designs. Well, patents also come into play in another area that involves John Deere. And what I'm going to talk about now for a couple minutes is the fact that this particular tooth shape, the business end of the tooth, this is called the John Deere Fangs Shape Tooth. And this shape has been patented by John Deere so that no one else can manufacture this particular shape of tooth. Uh, this was introduced by John Deere about two years ago. And right now, uh, through testing and through customer use, we found that there's some real benefits in some applications on the performance that this tooth can offer over other shapes of teeth that are out there in the marketplace. So it puts John Deere in a fairly unique position because no one else can offer a tooth of this shape. But then when we also look at all of the variety of styles that are out there in the marketplace where the patents have already run out, and it puts Deere in a, in a unique position in that we can offer Fang's shaped tooth to fit on virtually any style of adapt, common adapters that are offered. For example, the parabolic style adapters, or the Desco conical style adapters, or even the Caterpillar style adapters. <coughs> Already we've got them that fit the H&L pocket style adapters in some sizes. So what's really going to be unique is, is uh, sometime in the future, when and if the John Deere comes along with a fang-shaped tooth that will fit on Caterpillar style adapters, and then customers who want that particular configuration for their Caterpillar machines won't even be able to buy it from their Caterpillar dealers, they'll have to go to their John Deere dealers. So that'll kind of be fun to see how all of that shakes out in the marketplace. That's kind of unique. Okay. So, As you can okay. see on that design, it's cut, tapered in the, on the bottom side. It's a, the, uh, the whole idea of the, uh, the tooth is this makes less effort. It slices into the dirt. There's less drag on the, on the paper on the bottom. As the tooth is, is going through the dirt, there's, there's less resistance. And also on the tapered side, it's like the mold board on your, your plow, with your or the, or the uh, motor grader. Now you want to roll that dirt. Well, the dirt or the soil is, is rolling right on over also uh, easier on the, on the tooth as it's digging. It's, uh, it's clean, self cleaning but it's not plowing through. And then also the design of the tooth just slides in the dirt. It's been proven that it's got, it uh, uh, takes a, well, here's our the traditional tooth. It's you know, just flat. It takes a, they found it takes 101 0.5 pounds force for this to penetrate the soil. On the fangs, 98.5 of these pounds. That's 23% less effort for this to dig. If you got less effort to dig, you want to save fuel, easier on the machine, you get a quicker hold, so it's going to be more efficient. We've also designed that uh, it's a little it's thicker on the top side. Well, one thing is you got more metal, so you're going to have more wear material there. So there's 19% more wear than, than this style of tooth. But also, the added feature of this on that flare end is quicker loading. Once that dirt has penetrated, or the, the tooth has penetrated the soil, well, it doesn't do anything. It, the bucket doesn't load until it gets to the cutting edge now. Well, this is, with this little wing out here, a little flare in, it's starting to load the bucket quicker. So you're, you're getting a, a lot more action out of one slice, you know, than you would with a piece of bucket for this and three. Then as you saw in there, give me your flat team. Being flat, you know, that'd be just like a head loader plowing in. With that design, didn't you? I don't know if anybody, this might have been in the uh, class this morning, you were talking about, I guess, uh, teasing, trying to come up or earn a little. 
they found this takes about to, we're about 50 percent of its effort is one to or there's 50 percent force trying to get this tooth this tooth is trying to come back up out of the dirt and they found it's just about the opposite 50 percent of that effort is wanting to get more dirt so it's it's this is intended to dig in and this is the tendency it's just natural act is to come back out so you're really getting another added feature <laughs> not only uh, easier operation more wear and the thing says i want to do more so it goes down in the dirt and that's the thing the funny thing you know you think after how many years of, of people have been uh, digging holes and found up in so the soil and uh, we've had traditional looking teeth like this and all these others and then somebody only uh three years ago they come up with a better mouse trap <laughs> Uh, this has been on the market for John Deere since the uh, 90th, 1990, uh, uh, December, 1990. And it's, it's worked out great. We've got a lot of personal testimony with the people who are not here. So I guess it works good. It's not, it's, it's normally it's a general purpose tooth. Uh, don't claim it to be a dirt tooth or a rock tooth. The guys get out in tight soils, hang in some rock, and say it works pretty good. Is uh, Jeff, I guess he's found, I guess he's had a testimony where a guy is, dirt, the tooth wants to do so much more, and the, the, the customer, the operator likes it so much, he, he overextends it, and then you can't have premature failure because you're trying to do too much work with a tooth that wasn't designed to do you know, rock or something that may like that. Uh, the reason that we talk about things right now like this is not necessarily to promote the, the teeth to you, uh, but more so because of the fact that we have talked about the importance of the patents as re in regard to the style and the design of teeth previously. Now this is the one and only example that I'm aware of right now where we're talking about the shape of the tooth being patented and that's what's allowing a company to get into a controllable size of the marketplace. So that's what makes it a little bit more unique in the discussion that we have a little bit. Yeah, since you threw that in, it's, here's the parabolic. John Deere's got, here's our design Bang shape, shape. Our shape or patented shape, but it's on the parabolic. It fits this, this shape. There's, you know, the traditional tooth. Here's our, we go like this. Same thing. Uh, else we've got? We have, you know, there's the various sizes. Uh, there's, there's the, the pocket. Pocket yeah. style. The pocket shape. There's the main shape pocket style we have. So that's continues on throughout the month. And uh, here's one of kind of got. Well they also designed a fangs in a loader bucket for a scraper. Uh, the same rolling edge the mobile you know, self cleaning the, the dark uh, this this tooth works a lot more efficient and it is this taking place of anyway, that's our little shot. Okay, we're talking about methods to retain the teeth to the shanks. And we got as far as the side mounted flex pin and that's where we mentioned the fang shape, so that's kinda of how the discussion got off right there. Here's a picture of two, a picture of two flex pins, and you can see the two metal pieces bonded to the rubber piece in the middle. And as I said, when the, when this particular flex pin is installed, the rubber compresses, and then once it's in place, it it decompresses, trying to seek its original shape again. But there's still some compression that's left, and that tension holds the tooth securely in, in the shank. 
Here's a roll pin, once again a side pin model method. And here's a side pin through <coughs> pin to kind of wipe it through some of these fairly quickly. Here's a side pin pin and washer. This particular design with the pin and the washer is very common with caterpillar teeth. <coughs> caterpillar style. Here's an example of a top pin, top pin groove pin. Top pin wedge and pin. Remember we talked about the two main purposes of bucket tooth were to do what again? Very good. If we're looking at accomplishing both of those goals with this particular bucket tube, which do you suppose this would be better at? Protecting the bucket or penetrating the material? Okay, good. Yeah, I think so too. Why would you say that? Okay. Blood edge right here. It's, it doesn't look like this, this would be a very good choice if what the customer was looking to do is to penetrate the material. Rather, he's looking for something that's going to be pretty durable. Probably in an application where he's digging into a lot of rock or trying uh, big pieces of rock, loose rock, and that sort of thing, stockpile or something along those lines, rather than trying to penetrate and break through virgin material. Here's a, does anyone know what shape tooth this is? Very good. This is a top pin roll pin example. Does anybody know what style of shank and tooth this Very is? Long. This right here? Okay, very good. Very good. Here's an example of a top pin flex pin. Once again, what style? Here's an example of the heel lock we mentioned earlier. The heel lock style. Okay, the metal shoe is called a quadra lock. I guess we didn't mention it. The tooth fits on the shank and then it's about a quarter of a turn to click it into place. And then once it clicks into place, then the metal quadra lock comes down over the top and fastens it securely. Now, this might be a good time maybe to sort of make a little side comment about the importance of safety. A lot of times when people are talking about removing pins and changing teeth, um, there's a tendency to be thinking of taking a hammer and, and, and a punch and whacking pins out, putting new pins in, that sort of thing. Well, safety is always a concern. But uh, we brought along a safety poster, or a safety banner, and then two of the safety posters that just recently came along through the, through the mail through here. And they seem pretty pertinent based on common accidents that you hear people run into when they're talking about replacing bucket teeth and pins. Eye damage, or eye injury is very common. The particular industry that we're involved in with heavy equipment is probably one of the leading areas of personal injury of all occupations, except for maybe two or three. So it's some, safety is something that should be a concern on all of our minds at all times. And I'm sure that here at school, we stress safety to you guys all, all the time also. And it's something that, even from the manufacturer's point of view, we never forget the importance of safe operation and safety techniques. So we're continually reminding ourselves, dealers are reminding their customers Everybody is pulling together to make sure that safe operation continues. Because it's, a, it's a very, very serious situation that we have to be always on our toes about. As you know, that uh, the, the manufacturer is trying to make a harder tooth because it wears longer. And hard, hardness is going to be uh, susceptible to uh, breaking. Or chipping. Here, we're, we're, we're talking about installing these teeth and pins with, uh, with ball pin hammers or punches or whatever. You, know. uh, you need to be wearing safety goggles, eye protection of some sort, maybe gloves for protecting the hand because some of these pins are horizontal mount and they're hard to get in or something like that. And uh, you may smash a finger too. But uh, the safety goggles, that's what the, the pictures are there telling you. That, uh, you know, that one great view is, is uh, how you might be looking if you don't wear some kind of protection. You know, or you got to watch out for rocks and find out.
Uh, here's a uh, nice little tool. We were talking about the horizontal mounted pen. Uh, this is this particular tool is great for uh, uh, the, the pocket stop. You drive your drive your pen out, put that in there. You've got a place to hit on either side here. When you're installing the your, your tooth and pen, Got a little hole for it, a little, a little space for your starter, so you don't have to be holding the, the, the pin in. Then you hit on this side and drive your pin in. And then when you get down to the finish, you know, you won't, you'll have part of your pin sticking out. So now it's got a little flat space, and you can finish it off and get the pin flush on both sides. And this is hard metal, and it also says. Uh, wear eye protection. So you have to watch out. You want to be able to watch out, or otherwise you won't be watching it. <laughs> uh, you, all these materials, you know, they're good for the dirt. They're good for the soil because we're, we're trying to have a tooth or you're trying to have a retainer that lasts a long time, hold up. But they're, they're hard on eyeballs and skins. They will penetrate. Uh, this right here, here is price. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, worth every penny of it if you, if you need some side side. But it's forty dollars and twenty five cents. No. Uh, obviously, for, see here's a pocket. This is mainly for pocket style teeth. Larger the tooth, you're going to have to have it. Anyway, larger. <laughs> Larger is better, and they're probably more expensive. But yeah, you you have to have a. John, your protein bar is not real. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we're only forty-one pounds. That might be a good idea for all the back. Oh, yeah, for all the back. But uh, we 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 sell to you, and then we don't sell some because of the reason for that price. If a guy takes a couple of hours to try to change four teeth. And it's past a few fingers, he sees that, he said, that's worth every bit of that four dollars. <laughs> okay, so we have kilo lock with their quadra lock attaching hardware. Just have a couple more here. We have vertical lock. Here's an example. Once again, the, the tooth is identical to what we just looked at in the previous slide with the kilo lock. Sort of a quarter turn and then it clicks into place. Before you bring the tooth on, this little spring-loaded plug fits in that hole. If the spring is compressed, then you click in the tooth, and then this this little piece of metal right here, this bar, slides right down and keeps over the top of that plug and keeps that spring compressed, and then it's that spring tension that's pushing outside against this part of the tooth that secures the whole thing and holds it in place. Um, Here's our, the, our friend, the Whistlock, who we mentioned earlier that just had not caught on in the marketplace. But this is a picture of, uh, notice the one unique, most unique thing about this is the fact that there's no additional hardware that's necessary. So it does have some benefits that it can offer, convenience type benefits to the customer. It just hasn't caught on popularity. Okay, the uh, next topic we're gonna move along to is Shape. Um, fall right into it, I guess. Remember, we said the two main purposes of the teeth. See, I told you you'd get tired of hearing this. Was to protect the bucket and penetrate the material, right? Of these variety of shapes up here, which one do you think would be best at penetrating material? Right there. Why do you say so? Is that sharp point? I probably agree with you. So if we're looking to penetrate the material, if that's the most important thing in the customer's mind, probably what he's going to try and do is find the sharpest possible tooth shape available. If on the other hand, if he's more concerned with protecting the bucket, then how would you describe the shape of the tooth he might be looking for? Instead of sharp, what would he be looking for? Probably more blunt. Maybe. Pardon me? Okay, that might be a real good choice. So there might be a lot of different choices. All of those will 
provide a certain amount of protection for the bucket, won't they? But some will do a better job of penetrating than others. And also, some will end up doing a better job of protecting the bucket for a longer period of time, depending on the job and the material and the application and all that sort of thing. So those are some of the variables that come into play when we start looking at all of the variety, many different varieties of shapes that are out there. Here are some of the shapes that are available, common shapes, and, and these just happen to be John Deere teeth. We have pictures of This one is the fang shape we've already talked about. In some applications, this is a very effective choice, but in other applications, other shapes will work much more effectively than the fang shape. So this, no one shape is going to be the best choice in all applications and digging in all different types of material. Here's uh, what would be called a, a standard dirt tooth. This one happens to be a fabrication tooth. Here's another standard dirt tooth. This one happens to be a cast tooth or possibly ADI. We'll talk about later. Here's one that's a little beefier than this particular one. I think this one is a rock tooth, or maybe, yeah, I think it's a rock tooth. There's also another version that's a little bit, a little bit longer, and that's a long rock tooth, which would provide even but more wear, make a little more strong. This one is called a flare tooth, or some people refer to it as a wide tooth. This one's a star tooth, star shape, is what we're talking about with all these people. Does anybody know the name of this particular shape? Some people call it a tiger. Hensley calls it a tiger tooth. Some people call it a single point. Some people refer to this as a rock tooth. This one is, in Hensley's terminology, they call it a twin tiger. Some people call it a double rock tooth. I've heard people talk about. Also a twin point. I've heard that terminology. This particular uh, shape here is a, an abrasion panel tooth, or a panel abrasion tooth. That's a panel abrasion tooth. And also, some people call this a rock tooth. So sometimes we might have some confusion if someone is referring to this tooth and they call it a rock tooth, and another person understands a rock tooth to be this one right here. Quite a difference between those two, isn't it? So if you're asking for a rock tooth, expecting to get this, and somebody brings you this, it's not quite what you were looking for. So if that's part of the reason why the terminology is very important to understand. And then also be aware of the fact that other people may use different terms for some of these same items. This tooth here is a, a ripper tooth on the back end of a motor grader or a dozer to rip through material and kind of plow up the ground a little bit, surfaces around. This one is a scar part, which also is, does basically the same thing as a ripper, except it's a little lighter duty application. Do you all have any questions on any of those? Or where would you rather use one tooth in place than another? Like you know, we were talking about the tiger teeth and then the abrasion tooth, the star tooth, you know, when we had it to. You can say, well, where would you want to use it? Obviously, the single point and the double point tiger and twin tiger, as, as you mentioned in the previous slide, these would be used in situations where you have hard material and you're trying to penetrate. So if it's, if it's real hard, densely compact material, these will help penetrate and break it up a lot better, maybe than some of these teeth up here, which are referred to as dirt teeth for the most part. If you're in, go ahead. Uh, I was going to get back into that, wherever I was talking about the fangs earlier, you know, where that uh, 101 pounds of force that was on a traditional tooth here. Well, if you got 101 pounds of force, what if you're putting it on a single point? It's like a woman's high heel. You know, her high heel is about maybe she might be weighing less than I do, but I got a wider heel. I got a lot of, uh, more PSI on the ground than, than she does. Well, there, you're going to put a lot of force on that uh, that surface if it's you know, rock or tight soils. Uh, one reason. Uh, people have a twin point, they might put it on the ends of their bucket. If you think about the bucket, uh, the width, you had a single point all the way across, well you're going to have the side of your bucket doing some of the extra work because it doesn't have any, any penetration that's more or less coming in on the side. So uh, an operator would probably have twin points on the side of his bucket, on the, on the ends, end shanks, and then uh, single in the middle, 
can't see them. You know, you'll see them every, always way out there. You'll, you'll have this all the way across, and you have these all the way across, and then you'll have them mixed too. Which is probably <coughs> probably the most uh, appropriate way because you need that extra point out there. Okay. This is uh, why they call it a rock. It's the makeup of it. Plus, uh, you know, that panel you was talking about, as this wears, it keeps it stays sharp because there's a panel on the other side. We have a big blue one on the bench over there. You can look at it later on. But this uh, this wears real well. Uh, we've sent some of these out for the guy in rock, and uh, he is getting a lot of life out of this thing. Uh, Hensley is actually the uh, main manufacturer of that panel. Uh, that big blunted tooth that we saw a few slides back, if you wonder where that goes, well, that's Esco's version of a rock tooth. I guess they want to make a camera. Uh, that's, they call that a rock tooth. Uh, you, you're, if you want to say uh, which is the best tooth, you, know, you kind of wanted to know earlier. Well, what, what would be one common tooth to do it all? You really probably don't have a tooth. You know, you know, if you're going to do your general purpose, so if you're going to have a general purpose tooth, it will make you keep a little bit and never work. But like this tooth here, uh, you've got a lot of surface here. Well, when if you're in bud, you want quick loading. You don't need anything sharp. You need a, you need a big flare out there. You want to load all, all that material out there in your bucket. Excellent tooth for the right application. Here again is the, here's a star. As you can see them over there, we got a little uh, tip on top. It's kind of a, uh, a tighter tooth in the way. You've got extra surface on top. Uh, you think, well, that's great for concrete or something like that. It also for tight soils and rocks. They'll penetrate that rock and an extra uh, grit there to help strengthen the tooth. Uh, basically, it is. And you think, well, these are uh, what about those uh, fabricated? Well, the fabricated, yeah, they're, they're common too. They're, now your customer, your operator, he might be looking at economics, you know. That, that tooth is uh, maybe $2 less than these, uh, this tooth here. These are uh, maybe $4 less than this tooth. Uh, but then that may be all he needs, you know. Another thing is you've got to, if you we pass it around, a piece of the plate on the bottom. It, it can be a little sharper. Even. Some men will use it even in some types of rock. Since it slices the, some of the, the slate type rock, it slices it a lot easier than than uh, maybe your traditional tooth over here like that because it gets a sharper edge. Obviously their operator has learned how to work that tooth and get the maximum uh, operation out of it, maximum effect for certain types of material. So that's why you got a table full of big, uh, a table full of uh, teeth over there. You got a variety of shapes. As we said earlier, you got a variety of manufacturers that made their own pocket shape, you know, their own pattern, and uh, and they're still out there. You know, that's just one thing. And then you got side, <laughs> you got uh, small tractors have small teeth. Larger have larger. So, you know, that's a, I want to uh, pinpoint down on getting questions on any of the teeth and where should you use what. You, know, you might experience it someplace else later. Or if the last, the last end is the cut the operator. He may love one type of tooth and one application. How he puts it over, we tell him the correct way. He said, I've been out there 30 years digging holes. He said, I put the tooth on this way. He, you know, he's right. <laughs> after 30 years, yeah, he's got the yeah, he's got the way every way in the world to be right. Yeah, here you go. Which way you put it Yeah, leads right into it. We talk about some teeth are reversible, some teeth are not reversible. Basically, what we're talking about is whether or not the tooth is symmetrical. And if the tooth is symmetrical along this line right through here, it could be flip-flop either way, and it wouldn't change the performance of that tooth. The, uh, that would be a reversible tooth. And as you can see over here, this tooth is obviously not reversible because it is not symmetrical along this line right here. 
if this tooth was flipped around the other way, it would be riding pretty much flat on the surface like this tooth is. But when it's flipped around the way it's pictured right here, we have a much sharper angle of penetration. So if this particular tooth was used, let's say, in a loader application on a loader bucket, and the loader bucket was driving, or the operator was driving that loader forward, the tendency of this tooth would be to dig that, suck that bucket down into the dirt. So if the customer was trying to do some excavating with that loader, this might be a very beneficial way for him to equip that bucket because it gets the bucket to dig down into the dirt and get the bucket filled. If he's trying to stockpile, then he probably would have that flipped around because he wouldn't want that angle of penetration as severe as that. He wants something that rides up on the flat on the ground more like this. So he could dig into the pile of material over here without disturbing the soil down below. So there's both reversible and non-reversible teeth we have out here somewhere. Okay, the uh, next topic is tooth, where are we, tooth height. We're talking, we talk about material construction, and we're going to talk about the five different material construction types. We've got fabricated, forged, cast, ADI, which stands for, ready for this, terminology, austempered, ductile iron. If that means anything to you, I don't know, but I'm kind of proud that I was able to remember all those words and get them out of my mouth at one time. And then finally we have a nodular iron. These are not very common in the industry nowadays, so there's not too many of those out there. So we'll talk about these top four and just mention the fifth one because it does exist. You may hear it sometimes. First is a fabricated tooth. We have a couple of examples of fabricated teeth here. We've been holding them up throughout the day. And you have already seen them already. As you see, you can pass them. Fabrication, the procedure of fabrication, simply means that something is manufactured or put together. As you can see by looking at that tooth, we have two pieces that are welded together. The long piece, flat piece, is called the base. And then the curved piece is called the clip. The base is what actually wears in normal operation. The clip is what's used to attach the tooth to the shank. So the base is usually made of a harder material, more durable material, so that it can withstand more wear. And the clip is a softer, more resilient type of material so that it can withstand uh, shock forces that may come along back at the pin hole area. So it can withstand those shock forces without shattering because of being too hard or brittle. Usually because of the weld that holds these two pieces together, a fabricated tooth is not used in real heavy duty type applications. Other teeth will be more durable than the fabricated teeth. Here are some of the basic features and benefits of fabricated teeth. As you can read, mild steel alloy clip, or I'm sorry, mild steel clip and then an alloy steel blade because this is the portion that absorbs the wear. So that's got to be harder and be able to withstand that wear. Better. Here's another important key is relatively low cost. Often enters into a customer's choice. There's two pictures. Leads us on to the second type of tooth, which is forge. Can any, does anybody know what, or can you explain what a, a forging process is? Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, basically, they start with uh, an alloy steel billet. They heat that up so that it can be formed, and then they form that billet into the finished shape. And in this case, the finished shape is a bucket tube. That's basically what forging is. Um, when got a little arc. Feel the knee, feel the propulsion. This was a bucket tooth right here. Forging creates, inter in theory, it creates internal strength. It's kind of like the grains of a piece of wood. All of the grains of this steel, by going through the forging procedure, the grains all get lined up so that you get an effect something like this. It, in theory, gives the forged tooth more integral strength. Okay, for what it's worth. It's late today. 
Uh, the third uh, example is cast tube. Can somebody explain how a casting procedure works? Anybody? Who's our metallurgy experts in the group? Can you explain what happens? How, do, how does somebody make a casting? Just in general terms, not real fine detail or anything. <laughs> well, basically, we start with a hunk of metal, right? Or several hunks of metal. Then what happens to them? Heat them up, melt them. Then what happens to the liquid? Pour it in a casting. Let it cool down. And take it out of the casting. There you are. Clean it up, maybe. Rub the burrs off it, whatever it is, and there you have it. Basically, that's what a cast tooth is. The steel alloy is melted, poured into a into a, a mold, and then the mold is removed after cooling, and there you have your finished cast tooth. Um, compared to a fabricated tooth, usually a cast tooth will provide better uh, service life, longer wear, better resistance against breakage, and just a lot more substantial, more durable performance. In years gone by, forged teeth were considered to be of higher quality than a cast tooth. But in the more recent years, because of the increases in the technology of the casting procedures, oftentimes now we find that there are cast teeth that can perform every bit as well as forged teeth in certain applications. So if you may hear, talk to some people that have been around for many, many years in the industry, they may talk about the, the vast, you know, uh, vast differences and the better performance of a forged tooth will give than a cast. Well, maybe in years gone by that was true, but it's not necessarily true anymore. ADI stands for the Ostemper Ductile Iron. This is also a cast tooth, but the ADI procedure is a little bit unique. Compared to a normal or traditional cast method, where the metal is melted, poured into a mold, and then left to cool on its own, in the ADI procedure, the heating and the cooling of the metal is done under controlled conditions. 